Welcome to the party. I'm not here right now, but I want you to listen very carefully. These guys are very funny, so pay attention. Enough talk. It's showtime. Hello and welcome to Bags of Action. My name's Steve and my co-host is Pete. Hello. This episode we're going to be talking about the 1992 film Universal Soldier starring uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme and Dolph Lundgren. Indeed. So, this was Pete's choice. <laughs> you, say that with, Not so, you say that with such venom. It's like Sophie's choice. This, this was Pete's choice. So before any of you judge us, this was Pete's choice. It wasn't Steve's choice. Just so we're clear, up front we know exactly who chose this and whose favourite film it is. Uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, guilty as charged. It wasn't even the film I was going to pick. And I can't ah. even remember what prompted me recently to um, to change my mind to this film. Although I did actually, actually it might have been, we found a lot of old photos from when I was about 20 or 19 or 20. Uh, I think right. when I was just started uni, but I was going back home, obviously, for the summers and stuff. And I, I never realised before that my bedroom wall was all Reservoir Dogs and Universal Soldier posters. Wow. Yeah. So you maybe can guess where my uh, interest in this is heading. <laughs> all right. Well, Did you have well, any well, Universal well. Soldier posters, Steve? No. No? Okay. <laughs> Uh, at university, what did I have? Danny Minogue. Ooh, no, it's probably Kylie, I think. Um, I don't know. I can't even remember. Tolstoy. <laughs> we need Tolstoy posters. Absolutely, yes. A picture of that and The Hobbit and uh, War and Peace. Think. <laughs> and probably, uh, I, I, don't, I can't actually think what it would be. It's probably the same sort of posters they all came out cheap. There's a whole bunch that were the same around the same time that they flogged to all the university students. That's true. I don't remember. And we covered our walls. I don't think they sold any Universal Soldier posters to anyone else. No, it was just you. Yeah, just you. Pretty much. Yeah. So there we are. Okay. There we are. So, do you want to tell the listeners basic setup for this for this film? Yeah, the basic the basic premise is that soldiers who die in action, who are very good at their job, uh, they're frozen. It's a bit of a Captain America angle, really. They're fr- but they're, it's intentional. They're frozen by the military, and then years later, they are regenerated as the ultimate weapons. Hmm. Yeah, sort of reanimated. They're not dead as such. They're frozen moments after their death, or put on ice, as they, as they keep saying. Yeah. Um, and then they come back and... Uh, they're really, really, really good. But I'd forgotten that the film starts in Vietnam. Yes, it does. Mm, I'd totally forgotten about yeah. this. It does. So, uh, yeah, uh, Dolph Lundgren plays Andrew Scott, which is not a very convincing name for a man who's da- is he Danish. Um, Norwegian, Norwegian, Danish. Gosh, that's embarrassing. I don't know. Um, oh, let's let's find out yeah. whilst we're... Uh, anyway, carry on. Edit that bit out. Um, He's Swedish, you're right. Uh, yeah. I went through, I went all the way across Scandinavia then. Um, yeah, he basically um, is a sergeant who goes a little bit crazy, kills his own platoon, and starts killing hostages and cutting off their ears to make a necklace. Uh, and then he starts saying, Can you hear me? Yes, they wouldn't listen. I'm all ears. All those <laughs> kind of things. Uh, Bad puns. Whereas Luke is a farm boy, played by Jean Claude Van Damme. At least they give him a slightly uh, French-sounding name, Belgian-sounding name. Um, yeah. And they fight in the village. And then, it's quite good, some parallels with later, but um, as the kind of woman that they've got hostage starts to run away, he throws a grenade after her. And then uh, the two of them fight, and they kill each other. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, a, it's kind of a downer to begin yeah. with. The film just starts with, oh, okay, so 
They're both dead, and then it jumps back to the present It's a great day. dinner, because they get packed in ice, and then mm. their body bags being zipped up is how they do their names and the captions. Yeah. Which is really, that's uh, really cool. That was a nice touch, I thought. A very, very nice touch. So from there, it jumps to kind of almost a, a Bond, a, what would usually be like a Bond pre-title, doesn't it? It kind of yeah, yeah. you straight into a mission. Um. So this is, I, I really love this opening. It's kind of the Vietnam bit, and then the Universal Soldiers are going on a mission basically to um, stop uh, a hostage scenario, um, and they go, they scale a dam. Do you know where it is? Is it Hoover Dam? Yes, yeah. it's the Hoover Dam. I've been there, actually. I've not obviously done what they did, which was run down it. I've flown, uh, I've flown uh, over absolutely. it in a very small plane. Mm, I've, I've driven across it. We did the, I went to Vegas for a week, God, ugh, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, on holiday, and one of the day trips, we did a 4x4 out in the out in the desert, looking at the Joshua trees and so on, and they drove us across the Hoover Dam, as so we got to look oh, at nice. it and, and stop off and jump out and have a kick, couple of pictures and jump back in and stuff, so that was cool. So, yes, yeah, seeing it on this, though, you got to see the scale yeah. and the size of it, which is immense. Yeah, so they, they scale the dam, and they have to swim 13 minutes to swim a mile and a half. Yeah, quite fast, I believe. Um, mm. And then they introduce at the same time our eyes and ears, the typical kind of, oh, look, here's someone who doesn't know anything, so they can find out stuff, and so can we, um, which is Ali Walker, uh, plays a journalist. But also we get to see that, hang on a moment, Dolph Lundgren, uh, or Dolph Modler, as the preemptive text on my iPad has called him. Dolph Modler. Dolph Modler? <laughs> Um, what the hell's that? I think it's the yeah. It was it was trying to correct my spelling. Um, and oh. Van Damme, you suddenly see them, and they're together, and they're kind of cooperating with each other, or they're part of the same platoon. Um, yeah. But they're all taking information from earpieces and instructions, so you can tell it's not quite um, as it would normally be. But there's a nice little moment where the the, the, um, the general in charge. Uh, played by Edo Ross. Uh, from, Red, Ed, from Red Heat? Ed, is it Edo, Edo yeah, Ross? Yeah, Edo Ross. He's in Ed, isn't he the villain in Red Heat? Yes, yes. He's in everything around this time. He's brilliant. He always plays uh, dickheads in authority or villains. He's, yeah, big scenery chewer, isn't he? Yes, and so he says, he actually lets something slip, which I I was thinking, oh, it's their He goes, no, this is their third mission in the field. They're doing, you know, and this, they've got no problems and they said they had no casualties last time and no hostages injured in the previous two jobs. So they've got 100% success rate. The media know about them because they're saying, you've got to tell us something. Who are they? Who are these guys? We need to know something. And he won't, he won't tell them a single thing. He won't give them one clue as to what's going on. And then we, we find out why uh, pretty soon, though, after Did that. Did you recognize the other Universal Soldiers? Now, um, mm, I, I think, I'm not sure, I think one of them was Adam Baldwin, but I'm not sure. Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, go on then. I, the, one was Rolf Muller, uh, that's who the iPad thinks is called Dolph Modler. Uh, <laughs> uh, one was Rolf Muller, who was in a lot of films at that time, a lot of kind of straight-to-video stuff, but he's also in Gladiator. Um, oh, yes, the guy with the big chin. Yeah. Who, uh, mm. uh, Tiny Lister, who's yes. in... But lots of things. Uh, Fifth Element, I think, was one of the the bigger parts he had. And then two that I didn't know until I read the titles this time round and then looked it up. Uh, one is Simon Ree. Do you know what Simon Ree is from? No. He is the villain in Best of the Best. Okay. Who's the brother of the actor Philip Ree, who's the what, good guy lead in Best of the Best. And then the final one, which I think is my favourite, which I had no idea about, is Eric Norris. Can you guess who he is? Ooh, uh, Chuck Norris's cousin. He's his son. Who, oh, who, close. This is his only film role. Previously, he was a stuntman and a NASCAR racer. Right. Yes. So they're all cast okay. for their Oscar-winning acting ability. In fact, I don't think any of the other Universal Soldiers really speak more than uh, sort of one line each. I think the guy with the chin, remind me of his name, uh, sorry. Rolf Muller. Rolf Muller, he does have a couple of lines, but that's about it. Uh, I've just checked, and it wasn't Adam Baldwin. It was Muller that I was thinking uh. of. But, uh, but there you go. Hmm. Yes, so, so they've gone 
to rescue the hostages, and it all seems to go wrong because Rolf is shot like five times. Yeah. Uh, but then, oh, but wait, but, but wait. On, one moment, he's a decoy. Hang on. He's a decoy, but that, and he gets up but that, and means, it. that means he's invincible. Yes, he's got some kind of body armor or some kind of squibs under his suit, hasn't he? Surely. Surely? No. <laughs> and then I think this is around the same point that it suddenly links to the start, which I thought was quite quick, actually. Um, that you're flashing back almost to a scene that was about five minutes before. Um, but yeah. Because um, GR13 is, uh, is Dolph Lundgren. GR44 mm-hmm. is um, Van Damme. But they, yeah. um, Van Damme has a flashback when he looks at the hostages and then won't respond. So he basically won't give a status report. Uh, no, for that, on that he, sees, he sees an Asian couple and it flashes back to the couple that they had in Vietnam that uh, Scott shot and then he tried to save and all of that and, then, and he just kind of blanks and then they're really worried about him when they get him back after the mission saying, well, what happened? What's wrong with you? And he says, oh, you know, I, I don't know, I, I, innocent. He says, that's right, he says, he's innocent. Yeah. Um, so he's already starting, his memories are starting to come and back. And around the same time, the, the girl reporter... Um, is fired for being late, so she kind of, yeah, yeah. So she wants to kind of prove herself. So she grabs her cameraman, and they follow the Universal soldiers as they finish their mission. Um, which amazes me again, watching it again uh, years later, how yeah. stupid that decision is for one, and secondly, yeah. how easy it is to get into their base and get really close. Um, in you know, and they do they do get noticed, but it takes it does seem to be a little bit straightforward um, yeah and then she finds um rolf Miller's body doesn't she with gunshot wounds and he's on ice and then he opens his eyes and sits up yes and so she's craps herself um she takes a bunch of pictures but then she's seen on security so she's running back towards the car and the cameraman's like oh my god what have you done and they get in the car and they try to drive away um but they for some reason, he decides to drive into something yeah. whilst being chased, which then somersaults the car. Yeah, that was a weird moment. Again, I was like, I don't, I'm rewinding that. I don't know why they crashed. No. Yeah. I, 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 anyway, so it, they get caught. They get cornered. And, and it's Scott and Luke, isn't it? That I'm really surprised. It doesn't make a lot of sense, really, because they kind of had this little moment before. You think maybe they won't send those two in first, but they do. The other two that are sent in to kind of retrieve the journalist. Yeah, yeah. But then you get the nice flashback again where Dolph, just as uh, we showed that John Claude's memories are coming back, so are Dolph's memories because he snaps again, goes mental, and just shoots the reporter in the head. Uh, the, the cameraman, cameraman yeah. blows his head off, and she's screaming, and he's flashing back again, and he does the same kind of move of knocking uh, his gun out of his hand, yeah. knocking him over, and then running with the girl going, run, run, and pops her, puts her in the car and tries to drive off and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then he's driving along, and they give him an order in his earpiece to stop. So he yeah. does stop. And then she's like, what the hell are you doing? What the hell are you doing? Says, I'm confused. Yeah. <laughs> I love his one-liners in this. Some of them are just uh, absolutely yes, classic. Yes, one of my favourites later, definitely. Yes, I'm sure. Uh, I, I bet it's the same one. one. I bet it's the same one. <laughs> um, so she basically rips off his kind of um, headpiece, head yeah. uh, and she floors the vehicle, and then uh, off they go. And then it's revealed that for Meadow Ross's character that it's okay. We can just, you know, get, let everyone know. Oh, the government don't know what we've done. They don't know at all. Uh, we'll get arrested, so we're going to have to go after them without bringing anyone else in, which is a great little narrative device to mean that it's all contained within the characters we've already met. Yes, we don't need to bring anybody else in wider, the government, yeah. the media, they're trying to keep it as quiet as possible and just... Uh, and we haven't, mentioned, not... we haven't mentioned who directed this film, actually, have we? No, no, so it was our pal Roland Emmerich. Indeed, and this was kind of one of his breakthrough films, because he did Stargate straight after this, and then Independence Day... And then Godzilla, which the least I know about that, the better in my eyes. Yep. Um, yep. So he was kind of on his the start of his kind of Hollywood trajectory, really. Yes, but it was fairly fairly big budget, big names, lots of action. So it was in the mould that he came to be known yeah. for later on. It wasn't like it was a massive departure. No. Like he was directing some sort of French tragedy with subtitles and then went and did action films. That's true. 
That is true. Which, you know, it happens. It does. Uh, <laughs> you get people jumping from doing adverts to major films, and you think, really? Really? They pick that guy to direct well, it? And sometimes it I, works I, out, and you go, I know oh. you haven't seen the, the Captain America, the Winter Soldier yet, but you know, those guys have done You, Me, and Dupree. And then done that. So who knows? Maybe, maybe what? you don't have to have the background. Well, this is it. It's like the guy who directed Dread, which we spoke about last episode. For those who are still paying attention, yeah. um, and he, I think, hadn't done any films before. I don't think so. But he'd done other bits and pieces, adverts yeah. mostly, I think. Yeah, and, t- and t- TV films. shows and stuff. Mm. But anyway, so uh, so they they, they ha- go to hide out in a motel, and this is where something that I I really laughed at and thought was really funny. So they get to this crap, crappy motel. Now, this film is enforcing stereotypes across America yep. because the owner is sleazy. Yep. He's a money grubber. I've got the, word sleazy. the word sleazy is in what my notes says oh, sleazy really? motel boss. I put sleazy motel owner <laughs> on my notes. With a security deposit. It says, oh, it costs. Oh, what you've got is double occupancy. So that's another $10. Oh, and you want his. Ah, you see? Security deposit. That's another $20. And he's just ripping them off. Yeah. She's like, yeah, whatever, whatever. Because yeah, she and seems she so takes... desperate. And yeah. obviously Van Damme just seems like a large child. So, yeah, I think they're an easy mark. Yeah, and he's just, he starts to overheat. Yes. And he collapses in the room, doesn't so, he? So well, what, what, what did Van Damme do in all films around this time? He drops his trousers and shows his ass. Because, <laughs> like, uh, does he do the splits? Check. Does he show his ass? Check. That was kind of. I don't of... think he does the split. No, he doesn't. I don't think he does in this one. I think it scores. It scores a. Um, it scores an ass, but no, no splits. <laughs> Usually, most films had both. And in Double Impact, I believe it may have had two asses and two splits. But there we are. Uh, do you know what I've written down at this point? Uh, I put he shows his bottom, and I put <laughs> I, the word, I put the word wax and an apostrophe. <laughs> I've just put the usual ass shot. Wax exclamation nice. mark I thought you because were looking, there is you were not, looking very close. I was. God yeah, I was one. There was not one single hair on his on his little bottom. Can I just say or his... that isn't the shot that I had the poster of. <laughs> oh, I must have had a different one then. <laughs> uh but yeah, I just I looked at it and thought, Wow, okay, he's showing us his bottom, yes. And it, it, it's like he's been dipped in hair remover. There's not a single hair on him apart from his head. Oh, yeah. yeah. Smooth and sleek. And so I also noticed that their age at this point. So t- t- today, in 2014, Dolph Lundgren is 57, okay. and Jean Claude Van Damme is 54. Gosh. So at the time, Jean Claude was 32 and Dolph was 35. They, were, they both look really young in this film. Van uh, Damme, it, it, particularly. Van Damme looks about 18. That's what I was going to say. So given that they were both in their 30s yeah. and seeing him drop his trousers, I thought. <laughs> He counted the rings and it didn't look old enough. Yeah, yeah, I cut off his leg and counted them. But I thought, wow, he looks really, really young in his face. And then, you, you know, he's obviously in incredibly good shape. But I thought, he's 32, he looks about 22, yeah. 25 at the most. Whereas, but he's just... whereas now, in certain things, particularly in the cause ad, he looks about 74. It's true, he does seem to have, it's something that's caught up to him. Falling Dolph looks about, I don't know. 70 or something, but he's really craggy and properly... It looks like he's been hit with a shovel. A lot of times, yeah. yeah. But at this point, they both look incredibly young, and Jean-Claude the younger, a lot younger. Um, but yes, anyway, so... Um, he's there with his bottom out. Yeah. He needs to cool down, so he gets a load of ice, shoots ice and sticks him in the bath and um, cools off. Um, and then she goes to try and make a phone That's call. That's right, this but... is the point where she finds out, I think, from the TV that she's been framed for killing the cameraman. Uh, yes. As well. And they're looking for phones. And then while she's looking for a phone, he goes after her naked and then collapses. <laughs> and the motel owner goes, Mother, come out here. <laughs> <laughs> so he's trying to get his old mother to have yep. some kind of heart attack, is yep. my bet, so he can get the money from her will. So maybe he's just going to say, Look, he waxes his bum. <laughs> I think it's just to give her a nerdy birthday present. Say, look, I was going to buy you something, but that would cost money. So, here's a naked man. That's your birthday present instead. So, die so I can get your inheritance. Come on. But anyway, she doesn't die. She has a nice smile after seeing him, him with his wang out and his naked bottom. Indeed. Uh, so, the other thing I'd put is, so they, they've caught up to them. Yeah. The soldiers are taking down the phone lines and stuff. 
in their giant van, which looks not too dissimilar from a bin van. <laughs> it reminds, I think it reminds me of the, the um, Knight Rider lorry. Or I was thinking the wagon out of uh, Hellboy. Yeah. That kind of same thing where the back is converted into something. But the other thing I've written down is advanced technology. Giant computers! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the time before when we knew that the more advanced something was, it got smaller. It's kind of mm-hmm. early 90s. So now it gets bigger, bigger, bigger. The computers are so big, they have to be on a lorry. <laughs> Yeah, the whole of one wall is just covered in computers and like giant dials. And uh, it was the old screens where they were glass and they stuck out. So unless you were around at the time, you have no idea what we're talking about. But monitors used to be glass fronted, not plastic. And they used to bulge out towards you. And these are these giant computers, like almost BBC microcomputers. Uh, and this was the super advanced technology that they used to reanimate someone. I'm thinking, hang on, back in the day on the BBC, I couldn't get it to write 10, print, hello, 20, go to 10, 30, run, without it breaking. Good memory. You know? (laughs) This is not Chucky Egg. Oh, I love those games. Anyway, that's a different podcast. Maybe we should go on tabletop or something and talk about that. Um, But, yes, so you had your giant computers and they caught up to them. Uh, And then he sees the Nixon Warriors on TV and obviously starts getting... I was going to say nostalgic, not nostalgic. He starts Flashback, having flashbacks, yeah. and uh, then he starts running through walls. Uh, yes, because he knows they've been cornered, they need, need a way out, and they can't find a way out. And so he keeps, he just punches through all of the, the kind of really crappy walls until he gets to the end, and then there's Brick. And she's like, well, go on then. And he just, he just looks at her. <laughs> like, don't be stupid. Even I can't go through that. And then, uh, did he find the car then? Yeah, but it, it does kind of show that there are limits yeah. to what they can do. Which is good, because I think, to, because they still are in a human body, and I think that's quite a good thing. It means they are vulnerable, and you do feel they're under threat, rather than yes. he's some kind of complete superhuman. That's the thing. If he's if he's Superman, then there's no threat. He just walks out and they shoot him, and the bullets bounce off, and they're more likely to hurt other people than him. But with this, it's okay. He can't do too much, because he'll overheat, because yep. he needs to stay cool. His memories are coming back, but they're actually disabling in some way because they keep giving him flashbacks. Um, he can't jump through a brick wall, so he has to use cunning. And he doesn't, and he doesn't have $20 to play, pay the security deposit. No, no, he doesn't. <laughs> so he uses his cunning to uh, hide under the bed with some naked people, in, under the duvet. That's right. <laughs> I'd forgotten that as well. <laughs> the details I forget. Uh, well... So then she, she asks him, doesn't she, as they drive, they kind of drive off in the car then and get away. And then she's like, are you French or are you Canadian? You know, because your accent, what accent? Yeah. What accent? <laughs> he doesn't say, he really doesn't say very much. He really doesn't compare his word count in this to, like, uh, Terminator. Because it's not, he doesn't have much to say at all. Um, no. And he says, buckle up. And she's like, really? The people shot up the, mo- uh, the motel, they're chasing us, they frame me for murder, and you're telling me to buckle up. Buckle up. Oh, God's sake. So she does it just to shut him up. Yeah. Which is important later on. It is on. important later on. It's, it's a nice bit of foreshadowing. So they go uh-huh. to a, a garage, which run by another stereotype of an old, slightly um, discombobulated man in dungarees. <laughs> uh, and this is all set up for a bad joke, because he drops his trousers, because he knows... Again. There's a, there's a, I've actually put that. He drops his trousers again. Um, he's got a tracking device. So he puts, he stands in front of her naked, puts her hand around his uh, waist. Around his waist, thank you for the uh, yep. uh, reach around, um, and says, <laughs> <laughs> "Look for something unusual, something hard." <laughs> and then I, it's just poor. And then uh, she finds it in the back of his leg, and then I think she can't cut it out, so he cuts it out himself. I think for memory. Well, he cuts it, and then she has to That's pull right. it out. But this is the thing, right? So we know that they've been wiping his memories. They know that after every mission, all of them jab themselves in the back of the head yeah. in the chair, and it wipes their memories. But they can still do certain things. There's certain basic functions that they can remember. They can walk, they can talk, they can, they've got all of their weapon skills. So it doesn't, it doesn't wipe everything. My, my theory is that it wipes their short-term memory. Yeah, that makes sense. Which would make sense, because they don't really... 
sleep, as far as I can tell, in the entire film, do they? Well, they do. They they talk about them sleeping. I think mm. because um, almost a bit like a dollhouse, that like kind of like a short sleep to kind of recharge. I think because they talk, yeah. get Scott to sleep later. Uh, That's right. But I don't think we ever see them sleep. I think they have these kind of short bursts of. Um, yeah, that would make sense as well because, like you say, if their short-term memory is gone, but then their long-term memory and their subconscious is still mm. through their old memories. Exactly. So if they don't actually go to sleep for long, for or, or they make them use this stuff that wipes their short-term memory before they go to sleep, then it would mean they'd retain all the basic things, which is actually a flaw. I know I'm picking, I'm being picky here, but maybe it's the it's the wannabe scientist in me or something that or wannabe, you know, Frankenstein that. <laughs> They they wipe their memory, and yet, when he stood there naked in front of her, and he goes, is that supposed to be there? Or is that normal? Did he say, is that normal or something? And she goes, oh, yeah. yeah, 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 that's uh, that's that's normal. And then later on, I'm jumping slightly, when he goes to a diner and he doesn't know how to eat, yeah, I'm, going, kind of... I'm going, hang on, hang on, he doesn't know what his cock is, <laughs> he, but, and yet, he can run and shoot and jump and blow up people and drive but he doesn't know how to, one, eat, or two... Well, no, and actually, have... even if you go further to kind of base human-animal things... Yeah. If he... <laughs> Please, I'm talking about this. If an attractive lady, and he was about <laughs> persuasion, were touching him in the general area of his uh, what-have-yous, then uh, that could have caused issues. And equally, if you're hungry, you eat. You don't need to... Look, yeah. Look, you know, this is, we're jumping ahead, but looking over at how someone else is using a knife and fork... Is I didn't remember finding that as ridiculous as I did this time round. I mean, you know, it, it, it both of a comic effect. Yeah. You know, the, the, is that normal? And he drops his pants again and look for something long and hard and so on. <laughs> and, and then the eating thing. And no, I can't pay for it. And all that kind of stuff. So it's it's and he knows what money is though. That's the other thing. It's like, are you going to pay for it? And he's like, I don't know. No, I've got any money. So it, it's it's like flawed. But anyway, anyway, back on back on on track. She finds the tracker. She takes it out. Um, well, he, he cuts his leg and she pulls it out. Yeah. Um, and then that's it. They're sort of free from... Um, well, they, they can't be tracked anymore. No, but they already know where they are now. Yes. Yes. Um, and this is when she goes to... They go to the diner thing, I think, after that, don't they? Yeah, but this, yeah straight after this, this. This is where they set the trap for the Unisols. Yes, so she goes to make a phone call to try and find out what's going on, to talk to her editor or something at, at the station to say, look, it's all bullshit. And he sits down and orders the, she's ordered the specials for him, and he just sits there and starts shoveling in the food after copying the bloke at the next table. Yes, yeah, before that, because um, there's quite a big action scene before that, with the, where they set fire to everybody. Oh, of course, yeah, yes. So basically, so at the, they set a trap at the petrol station, the petrol yes. station um, which basically means that it's a good way of wiping out the threat and bringing it down to, because, you know, without spoiling this film, if you haven't seen it, but if you haven't seen it, why are you listening? Um, obviously, it's <laughs> going to end up with Van Damme versus Lundgren, just to pre-warn you, but they obviously need to get rid of some of the universe. What? Way, no. It is, it's true. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be the end. It's going to be like the start. I'm just going to I'm going to put that out there. Um, uh, unlike uh, Van Damme I'm not going to put that out there but I'm going to put that out (laughs) Uh, hello hello. what's that Um, yeah so he blows them up they're all on fire and then the scientists are running out of the truck to try and um, to try and uh, put the fire out Um, basically he's hidden in the boot um, wrapped in ice that they both have so there's no heat signature they've also hidden the guy from the garage in there as well which yeah yeah, so they get they and they run into this is the, this is the most panto thing I think in the film is that while they're all on fire we're going to run into the truck and collect all the paperwork all the paperwork all the evidence that's lying around in the truck whereas yes. you know that would all be on these days that would all be in the cloud <laughs> well, back in the days of Skynet yeah. it was on a hard disk that's true but all printed they just print it out just, like, just to make yep. sure that there's evidence available we've printed it out so this is quite interesting because then he gets to blend into the real world because he's, he's put on the, um, the, the the old garage guy who's the identical size to him he's put his clothes on um, oh, Joe. and then he goes to drive off but um, uh, Dolph Lundgren's in his car isn't he he tries to strangle him 
That's yeah. right. She he says buckle up, so she buckles up, and then Dolph jumps onto the front of the car, and no, no, he's, he's in the back seat of the car. To him, so when he slams the brakes on, he flies over him and out the windscreen. So he, and I think he actually says he should have buckled up or something. It's not even in the space of five minutes. They've done quite a good little road safety campaign. Yeah. Well. Okay. I'm not sure that was the purpose of the film, but uh, at the, at, more at, the, comedy. at this point as well, which is again another kind of way of quite good way of moving the story forward, is that the plug's been pulled, the mission's been cancelled. They've basically been told, "Look, just write it off because all these have been burned. Um, yeah, let yep. them go. Just forget about it and go back." But that's where um, GR13, Dolph Lundgren, refuses to go, and he and he says, "My name is An- Sergeant Andrew Scott." Scott. He shoots. Um, Ed Ross, the colonel in the eye, um, removes his ears yeah. and takes command. Yes, and so he wakes up, takes over. And isn't this when he goes into a supermarket? No, that's not yet, I don't think. Hang on a second. Uh, well, but they're burned. It's, it's not too far off. Oh, no, no, it's when they blow up the van yeah, that he does yeah, that. Yeah, it is. It's not for, oh, a okay. while. not for a little while. Yeah. So, yes, dine, this is the when he then goes fixed, to yeah. the diner. He eats a lot of food. He keeps ordering more and more. This is the other thing. How would he know? If, if he doesn't know what food is, and yet he's shoveling it all in, does he just kind of say, I'll have one of everything? And that's why she keeps bringing all of them out. I think so. Anyway, so she brings the menu to him, and he continues to eat plate after plate after plate of food. Um, and she's uh, only after she's delivered a dozen plates does she say, have you got any money to pay for this? And he goes like, nope. And he said, this is where one of his great one-liners, I just want to eat... <laughs> is that it? Yeah, I just want to eat. And it's, 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 it's to me, this scene is very reminiscent of Kickboxer, the scene where he's taken to the bar and they get and they get him drunk, and then he's fighting people off while still going back to his drink. It feels right. very similar to that because he's trying to like he's got a burger in one hand and he's yeah. like punching and kicking someone in the other hand. And so yeah. and again, this is the most kind of I mean, obviously there's some stuff later, but he does a lot of sort of over the top kinetic kind of mar- typical Van Damme martial arts in this scene but it works quite well I think as a as a humorous uh, scene as well there's a bit of a weird thing as well though that, so while he's doing this she's off on the phone trying to get through to sort of someone right and she dials a, um, it may have actually been in the petrol station she dials somebody um, by a number right but she dials a fax machine by accident the first time right and I, and I, and I thought is that important? Is that going to come back? Or is that just showing that she's clumsy? But nowadays, people will be like, well, what the fuck's a fax machine? <laughs> <laughs> How often do you ever use a fax machine these days? No. I, like, somebody never. asked for a fax number the other day. I laughed. I thought they were a time traveller. Yeah. But, you know, 1992, you've got these giant computers and a fax machine. Oh, fax, yeah. It's high tech. Yeah, yeah. Fax machine it's was like... The newest tech mach- it's the newest technology. The paper travels like, like a teleporter. I, I, I don't get it. I just you, explain it to me again. Do you just crumple it up? What? <laughs> uh, it's like that advert years ago for paying online. We had these two um, old retired people opening up the disk drive of their computer, folding up a check, putting it in, and then closing the drawer and expecting that's how you pay online. Is that not how you do it? Well, that's what I've been doing for years. Um, but <laughs> it's that kind of level of. Yeah. But anyway, so she dials a fax machine. Yes. I don't. I don't know why. I think anyway. it just will take her slightly longer to come back so he can eat more <laughs> and kick more people in the head. Or maybe it's just to show that she's a bit yeah. ditzy. I don't know. It is weird, anyway. isn't it? You would think that when they're going through the script on a rewrite stage, they might go, you're the bit with a fax machine. Why is that in there again? <laughs> so you get some great bits in the fight, some comedy bits as well, where um, he throws someone onto the pool table, and of course, what happens? They pot the balls. Absolutely all of them. Pop, 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 he pops them all. Yay! <laughs> I, did, I did laugh. I just started chuckling at that point and thought, yeah, just go with it, okay? He's got the silly one-liners. He's eating the food. He's punching them whilst chewing a burger. I just want to eat. Just just go with it. Um, so I started laughing and enjoying it. We kind of jump between here, don't we? They keep going back and forth between here and Scott back on the, um, yes. on the truck. So the two scientists. Now, who's the guy, the older guy? I recognise him. He always plays scientists yeah. and geeks and things. I can't remember his name, though, sadly. Sorry, sir, whoever you are. <laughs> I don't know why I said that's okay. <laughs> it's, it's no skin off, <laughs> You're forgiving me. It's, it's You're no forgiving skin me. off my nose. 
Oh, OK. Thanks, but he was, this is quite a good moment for later as well, because Scott is kind of injecting himself repeatedly with muscle enhancers so that he can yes. be stronger and stronger. Um, but he also, they, well, he kind of, they try and convince him that his thermal monitor is not is registering hot and he needs to sleep um, and have his serum. Um, and then they send the, uh, the scientist in to relieve the pressure. But um, he manages to kill the scientist by injecting him through the face. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm not quite sure about that, but he kills him mm. anyway. Um, it's really not going well, and the chief scientist is kind of left on his own. And you know that he's he's not long for this world. No. So I think he tries to take matters in his own hands later on. Oh, that's what I just remembered as well. The end of the diner scene. She's on the phone trying to find his doctor. Uh, yeah. Who? Yes. And uh, she realises something's going on when Van Damme throws someone out the window. Yes, yes. He just sort of shatters the glass and the body flies out into the street. The old kind of... It's almost Western. Yeah, well, and it happens, I think, you know, a couple of years later in Hard Target, he's fighting in a bar and throwing people out the window. So, uh, another trademark, along with the spits and his shaven bottom. Well, I think it was waxed. I think okay. it was waxed. well... I'm not going to ask him. <laughs> so I'd forgotten as well that they do some cool little um, uh, military graphics that tell us what day it is. So mm. it's day three, but it's it's night time. And the lorry, the bin lorry, as you're describing it, <laughs> has yeah. shattered all my uh, childhood illusions, um, <laughs> turns up. And basically, a, a lot of rednecks start mocking. Now, I, I, Dolph Lundgren is a very large man in military uniform. Uh, with, I think, a necklace made out of human ears. Yeah, but did you notice where he went to get the information? No, of course. Some... So, so I, he pulls up somewhere, and I thought it would be like a truck stop on the side of the, of the road, and that's why he'd think, oh, you know, they pass this way, I'll yeah. stop and find out. But it, it, it wasn't a truck stop, really. Do you know what it was? No. It was a titty bar. Oh, so this was, yeah, so you had the neon pictures of women's glowing breasts, and I suddenly thought, am I watching from Dusk Till Dawn again? The thing is, is if this, this, is this film had been made even two years earlier, they would have gone yeah. into that bar for around a quarter of an hour <laughs> for no reason whatsoever apart from to show ladies' bodies. I think 92 was the kind of, do you know what? We'll let them wear vests. <laughs> But the fact that they all seem to think his his you know chain of ears aren't real. They're no. kind of like, oh yeah, they're cute. I'm thinking, could you not see the blood? Yeah. I personally <laughs> would have let him be, get on his way. If there was a brick wall, there would have been a Steve shaped hole where I burst through it and escaped. Never mind that whether or not I'm <laughs> superhuman, I'd be gone. I'd just be out of there. No, they're getting I, their belts beat up. I agree. And this is the same point where the scientists then. We get another unisol gets picked off. So, uh, Rolf Muller, or yes. Rolf Modler, uh, he <laughs> gives them the order to hold a grenade. Um, so they're not complete, you know, apart from our two main characters, the others aren't sentient, they're, they're still blindly following orders. So he yes. puts a grenade in his hand and it goes off. He says, hold it for 30 seconds That's right. and let go. But unfortunately, before he manages to, to finish giving them the order, the uh, the soldier closes his hand around the scientist's hand of and he course. can't pull it free. That's right. So he's that there, he's right. like, no, no, and he's trying to pull his hand away and he can't. So he kills himself uh, when he drops the grenade right. and blows up with them. It's good, it's good scripting to get rid of characters in quick succession like this. Um, yes. So this is the bit that you mentioned about dragging the supermarket dragging into the supermarket, which is one of my favourite scenes in the film, I think. <laughs> Go on, tell us what happened. Well, he just drags it. He just gives this speech. It's a really bizarre speech. Because I think it's some good acting from Dolph Lundgren. That's not a sentence I've used before. Um, and he just kind of... <laughs> what, what are you saying? Well, what are you, you saying, know, don't, Please don't tell him. Uh, he just delivers this monologue as if he's still in Vietnam and all about, you don't know what's going on out there. You don't know what's going on out there. And it's just... Um, I, I like that. I like that bit. Uh, and at the same time, while this is happening, um, Ronnie and Luke are going to find the dad from Dirty Dancing, who is the doctor. <laughs> He's baby, that... baby's dad. Okay, yes, Jerry Orbach, yes. who is also 
uh, one of the main guys for about 50 years on Law and Order. Okay, yes, of course he is. He played yeah. Lenny Briscoe from 1991 to 2004. That's impressive. See, about 50 years. And that makes and he was it in... more embarrassing that I recognised him from Dirty Dancing. Well, I knew him from that, but I wasn't going to say it. Um, <laughs> He was in 274 episodes of Law and Order. I, just, I'd be bored. Anyway, um, maybe he's got a lot of kids. Well, you know. Yeah. But he's, he's passed away now, sadly. Oh. He died in 2004. He's only 69 when he died, which isn't very much. But, uh, but yes, there you go. So they, they find, through Luke's file, they find a name that keeps coming yes, up. Dr. Uh, Doctor Gregor, is it? Dr. Christopher Gregor, yeah. and then they go and find him at his home. They drive there and find and it, him. This is flat. quite a quick kind of bit of exposition. They see him. Oh, hello. Oh, hello, Luke. Yes, they're dead flesh made live. It's, quite, it's always that quick, isn't it? It's kind of, they ask him a few questions and he just suddenly tells her everything that they've done, which I find really weird. Yeah, because he's, he's, as soon as he sees him, he starts having flashbacks and they get worse and he says, oh, you know, I thought this might happen. Dramatic recall. Yes, post-traumatic stress disorder, just you know, something like that, and the fact that he's been dead. And they dead. basically, yeah. what they've said is that the last, the last kind of thing that you thought before you died is going to be your overriding emotion. I quite like that. So Scott's thing is, I'm in Vietnam in the war. So when he comes back, he thinks he's there still in Vietnam and he's still fighting the war. Luke wanted to go home because his tour was over. So he, his overriding desire is to go home. Um, yes, but this is also yes. quite a poignant moment because it's the point where Luke realizes that he's dead, which uh, he hadn't realized before when he was eating. Yeah, because you know we're mocking the technology and stuff, but for him, they don't really touch on this too much. Probably because he went from the jungle to being constantly on the run, and he didn't really get to see any technology. But thirty years has passed, and doing it from the nineteen eighties perhaps to now, there'd be a much bigger change. It's that whole Captain America thing yeah. of of giant buildings and noisy airplanes and helicopters and mobile phones and neon everywhere in Times Square. It's not quite that thing, but that's kind of missing, I think. Yeah, but I think in a way, because they're, out in the, they're kind of out in the Sticks, desert yeah. kind of thing, aren't they? So they, they're, they're, and maybe that's why things seem so stereotypical. They, maybe that's a deliberate thing, particularly because the director's not American. Maybe it's a thing to go, look, some of these things haven't changed. And if you went yeah. to a diner, it might be just like the diner you went to 30, 40 years before, if you went to a, um, to get gas or to a motel, because I mean, I think the motel, the garage, and mm. the diner, they're, they're kind of American staples, aren't they, in that kind of, you know, out in the, in the desert, that, yeah. that, you know, Route 66 kind of thing, that they may, certainly on the surface, seem unchanged. Yeah, yeah, and plus his memories aren't very good anyway, no. so he doesn't, I guess it's less about looking at the present and the past and more about finding out who he is. That's the main kind of driving him. Yeah. What happened to him? Who he is? You know, what's been going on? That kind of a thing. And I think it's always a thing, again, it's a bit like Captain America, is that it's not always about the things that have happened since you've been gone, because to you it's just the next day. Yes, so actually, he's, this is, if it's the first time he's kind of really been knowing what's going on, and the same guy who was trying to kill him yesterday, although yesterday was 30 years ago, is trying to kill him again then he hasn't really got, you know, there's no real big thing to adjust to initially. Yeah, um, yeah. So this, he's always been trying to keep her safe, hasn't he? So he, again, probably because of the overriding emotion from before, he tried to put her seatbelt on, he tried to stop her smoking when they were at the diner, and now mm -hmm. he gives her a bus ticket, doesn't he? And basically, she's got her story, because she said to him before that the only reason she was with him was to get her job back and to have a... a to get a story. Yeah. So he sends her home. This is quite a nice little scene because she starts. She gets. She goes to get on the bus. The bus pulls away, a bit like on Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Um, she what? It doesn't matter if you've never seen that. What? Between that and Dirty Dancing, I'm really doing myself no favours. Um, so the bus pulls away and do you wax me? Tell me. <laughs> I'm not right now. I'm not right now. Um, so you can see her standing there, but you can also behind her see loads of armed police. Yeah, that was great. It just kind of, ah, oh, she stayed. Oh, shit. There's like 30 police cars. They're all armed. They're all stood there pointing at her. And it's like, oh, they're really not going anywhere, are they? Except jail at this point. Um, but yes, and this is when 
Scott starts chasing them in the giant uh, bin van. I can't believe you keep calling that. Yes. <laughs> I can see why you're confused. Loads of men in uniform jump off it and uh, take out the trash. <laughs> some, some whisking it away. Oh, wait, yeah. something else. Uh, so, y- yes, he starts... Are we having fun yet? Is what he keeps saying. The hammer he gets, though, and the, the better, I think. Yeah, and he starts throwing grenades. You know, so he shoots it up a bit, mm-hmm. and then he starts throwing grenades. Which seems to be in. his thing. He's, he, I think he throws quite a few grenades in this film. Yeah, he does it right at the beginning, he does it later on, he does it here, so he obviously loves them quite a yes. lot, I think. <laughs> uh, and she keeps catching them and, yeah. and trying to throw them back up. Whilst at the same time, she, he's already killed the driver... Uh, John Claude's trying to get to the front. He's trying to pick the lock almost and get through to the front, which is probably you know as important. But maybe he should deal with the grenades, given that he's a bit more impervious. But anyway, yeah, it does seem the wrong way round, really. <laughs> but anyway, she deals with he that. Tell, She's a good and, and he tells her to jump, then doesn't he, from the from the bus? Yes, yes. Whilst he's pushed towards a cliff, yeah, heading towards a canyon, a spot on it, and uh, so I think. I, I think Hasn't he shot Muller at this yeah, point? Yeah, so basically there are no right. other Unisols left, I think, now, because he shot the other just as the bus um, goes over the edge of the canyon. That's right. He gets a gun from one of the guards, I think, the dead guards, and uh, takes it, shoots Muller, and then who was in the driver's seat, and then the bin van and the bus and everything goes over the cliff with Scott going, No! And Dolph is no That's more. It. He's dead. Yes. Uh, John jumps, and he's okay. And, and then a local policeman turns up and wants to take them both in, but she hits him. It's yeah, such a nice yeah. touch. He's been through absolute hell. She saved him several times by throwing the grenades out. And at that point, he's obviously knackered. He's, uh, he's really tired. Um, she try, and he just tries to cuff them. So she gets up and just punches him out. Yeah. And, he, and he looks, just gives her a look. And she goes, I had three brothers. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's, you don't need any more than that. That's just that's just such a nice touch yeah. that's like, done. Job done. Right, off you go. And they steal his police car and drive off. They do. And then this is day five now, according to the graphics, and he yes. has gone back to his parents' farm because, obviously, his, over- In Louisiana. his overriding emotion was to go home. Um, his mother sees him alive. Doesn't seem that perturbed that, Surprise. that he's looks... He isn't 50. He's, he hasn't aged a day in 30 years. 25, yeah, 25 years, isn't it? And he's supposed to be 50. Um, so that's weird. And then she leaves, doesn't she? she or she's going to leave to go to the back to the network. Um, but the weather's bad because a storm is coming. Mm. Oh, plot point. Um, she runs out in the rain. According to this, take the policy car. That should say police car. Um, <laughs> but, Thank you, autocorrect. Yeah, but as she gets to the policy car... Uh, oh no, it's Scott. He's not dead at all. Shock horror. Um, <laughs> you know, I've actually forgotten. I thought that was. Oh, it. really? Thought, you didn't think you didn't realize is, No, so I thought they got to the farm. Yeah. She, his mum opens the door yeah. and he just like. Battles. And she goes, oh, look, like, mother. Yeah, and it ends. Yeah, the Rambo. Right to black. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I just thought, ah. Oh. And then I looked at the te- run time and I went, 20 minutes left. Jesus, how long are the credits? I went, that wasn't it. There was more. No. So Scott then has basically got her and Luke Devereaux's parents. And the ending, I don't know, do you, is it, this ending is very similar to an, an early Van Damme film. Go on, tell uh, me. Cyborg. The end to Cyborg is virtually, it's, it's a fight in a very similar setup in the rain. Very similar. Anyway. Okay. So Luke tries to reason with Scott. and But hang on a moment. Scott is much stronger because he's had all this muscle serum. He can now... Take some more. Yeah, take some more, throws him through a barn door. It beats him relentlessly while still injecting himself. So, yeah, it's kind of the, the rocky thing now of kind of, can you possibly... Um... And then my favourite thing, and I don't know why, but it's just the way he says this line. So he goes to shoot Ronnie uh, in the head. So, again, another mirror back to that first scene with the... Um, person he shoots in Vietnam yes. pulls the trigger nothing happens and he goes it's empty it's empty <laughs> which for years I thought he said it's empty it's empty private I don't know why but I, I quote that line a lot to various people who have no idea what the hell I'm on about I do uh, that thing about the game uh, you're the computer game Gauntlet yes 
I, I, quote, I quote this thing all the time when I'm hungry, and people don't know what the hell I'm talking about most of the time. <laughs> like I go, ooh, Blue Warrior needs food. Bad. <laughs> Do you remember yeah, that? <laughs> but people, don't, people just stare at me. It's like, okay, if you're of a certain age, you know. It's like, Blue Warrior needs food. I'm the only thing. person who ever has understood me going, it's under, it's under, <laughs> it's my cousin. Uh, and anyone else just looks at me like I've had some sort of seizure. Yellow Warrior is about to die. He's uh, under. <laughs> <laughs> we have our own catchphrases oh, from now on. I like it. That's so, cool. um, she manages to cut herself free, doesn't she, at this point? Uh, yeah, so he's beaten, getting the crap beat out of him. She's hand, uh, t- tied up with a rope. Uh, the combine harvester thing that she manages to break the rope bonds. Um, right. And he's saying, run! And then, run. oh no, hang on. If she runs, yes. that's my bottom dollar. If I've seen a lot of films in my life, that Scott will throw a grenade after her. Oh, he loves his grenades. Of course he does. And it, according to this, it explodes and he celebrates. <laughs> 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 that's not an autocorrect that's an, an auto uncorrect because I'm uh, sure celebrates is a word I'm not sure celebrates is no <laughs> yeah so he thinks he's done it he thinks he's killed her and he's celebrating at that point but, so then Luke in, in the kind of rocky fashion almost it's that hang on a moment I, I now have motivation before you just had my parents hostage I couldn't really give a shit now, you, you throw a grenade at a woman who I may find attractive in a slightly unconventional big age gap, and I don't know what my penis is, kind of way. So, I am angry with you, Dolph Lundgren, and I will kick you repeatedly in the head. But only once I've injected myself with some ah, of stuff see? to make me the same strength as you. And that says here, he injects himself now. Good night, asshole. Now he has, <laughs> now he has the upper hand. Well, he's, this is it, though. It puts them on equal footing. Does. But because he's more motivated, the fact that I mean, his parents have been tied up, he's going to kill him, he's already just killed Ronnie, uh, he's invaded his own his home that he's come back to after 25, 30 years away. Um, I, I just and so, had this, I've just, all I've written is goodnight, arsehole. I'm assuming that at some point Dolph Lundgren said that, and then Luke said it back. I don't think so. I don't know. Why have I, why have I just, just, maybe it's just... That's just Plan- music. Planning out to sign off the show to you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Good night, Arsenal. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yes, they have a big old fight. the adult version of the Nicholas Linter sitcom. Yes, good night, Arsenal. Good night, sweetheart, for those who aren't keeping Indeed. up. Indeed. What the time traveller. Anyway, uh, so, <laughs> yes, uh, I've written at this point, Ew, Thresher. Oh, yes. Well, he double-footed kicks Scott through the door. Um, yes. I forget, this is the rain and fire cheesy finale. Mm. Um, he kicks Scott into some big spikes he, on the threshing machine. They, oh, well, yes. well, he's obviously dead, isn't he? You know, he's dead. Again. Dead. Uh, Over. Hang on a moment. Finish. His eyes have opened. And he's pulling Luke's face closer and closer to the spike, which is, again, a staple of action movies, but a good one. Always. But Always. Luke grabs Scott's arm and breaks it and says... You're discharged, Sarge. <laughs> and again, another great typo, and pass him through the chopper. Pass he passes him. him through the chopper, apparently. Right. Uh, yes, he turns on the thresher and essentially grinds him up it's, into it's dog a, It's food. a Fargo moment, isn't it? Yes, and spits him out uh, into tiny, tiny pieces that aren't going to come back. And that, that kind of seems like that's the end of him. And then he goes and checks his mum and dad are okay, and they're okay. Yeah. And then he goes to see Veronica. She's out cold. Is she dead? Because everyone so far who's seen dead has been very dead. Yes. Oh, hang on a moment. She's coughing. She's alive. Hooray! He hugs her, and then body count starts singing. <laughs> <laughs> it's really left hanging as an ending. I think I don't appreciate it's like oh okay they're both she's alive, but it it, it did feel like it was missing some extra scene. What you wanted some text up at the end I that don't said know. Luke lived out the rest of his life in isolation on his farm. Maybe I suppose or Ronnie kept his until, secret until the sequel. Uh, but yes, I'll come on to those in a sec. Um, I don't know. It just felt like it needed another beat, but I don't know what that beat would have been. But you know, yeah. I'm a fan of iced tea. I like body count, so I don't mind. Uh, Have you ever seen the music video for that? 
I don't it's, think so. I think, from memory, it's like Bonnie Counts in the House. Um, it's Ice T and the band, and then I think that Dolph and Van Damme are kind of walking behind them in uniform and maybe occasionally dancing. I'm going to have okay. to try and find that, I think. Right. Because that sounds. Either I've misremembered it. Or you or dreamed I it. I dreamed it. Uh, or it was very ludicrous. I'm going to look that up while we continue to talk. So, are you ready for some trivia time? Now? Oh, okay, yes, because I've hit you with my Norris facts. Okay, so, so the 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 actor that played his father, uh, John Devereaux, Luke's father. Have, do do you recognise him? No, no, I do not. Okay, so he's a, an actor who's been around quite a long time. He's been in lots of different things called Rance Howard. Okay, does that sound familiar for any any particular reason? Is it Ron Howard's dad. Correct. So, do you know who did the score for Universal Soldier? Howard Shaw? No, 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 that's good. I was trying good. to do it's it. Good, but it's not quite right. I'm doing the old uh, was... catchphrase thing. It's good, but it's not quite right. I'll give you another guess. It's not a well-known guy that's known for doing films as, su- as such. He's known for other things in particular. So he's not a typical oh. film score guy. No? No, I don't know. Okay, so it's, it's a German guy oh. called Chris... Frank or Frank, yeah, Chris Frank. Okay. So, you ready for German, the you ready for the, director, the degrees of German uh, composer? Yeah. You ready for the degrees of separation now? He played the Fonz in the German remake of Happy Days. <laughs> Nearly, oh, but no. Okay. So, so in this film, Rance Howard plays yeah. John Devereaux, who's uh, Luke's father. Yep. Okay, I'm following. Okay. In Babylon Five. Rance Howard played the father of John Sheridan, who's the main character. Okay. And the person who scored the entire five series of uh, Babylon 5 was... Chris, Chris Frank. Frank. I wonder if he put him forward. So this was... Oh, Babylon okay, 5 yeah, started yeah. three years oh, yeah, after yeah. this. Okay. So maybe when... Excuse me, I know it's not my role here, but <laughs> I, you may know my son, he's a director... I know a, a German fellow. A German fellow is a composer. He would be brilliant for this. So I think I think it's just one of these things where JMS to go create Bubble Five was like, you know, we get some great actors on the, on the show yeah. off a one off, and they got Rance Howard in. It's like brilliant. But yes, he'd uh, he'd previously worked on the film with Chris Frank. Uh, who did the scores? So there you go. There's my my five degrees of Babylon Five. Everything comes back to Babylon Five. I'm impressed. In my house. In my uh, house. You know. If I, I could have should put money on that being Babylon Five related. I should just say every time you throw me in the tube, I should go Babylon Five. You, go, oh my god, yep. how did you do it? So, <laughs> I can't tell you my workings. Uh, I'm not able to do that. But yes, it was Babylon Five. Yeah. So what's your bit of uh, trivia? Oh no, because my I think was earlier actually with the um, who are the other Unisols? So oh, I right, don't have right. any uh, oh. other trivia. I'm afraid. I mean, it was, I mean, it was written by Dean Devlin, but he's written all the Henry. But I say that. The original script was written by two TV writers who all they'd done before this was Deadly Nightmares, which I think was also known as the Hitchhiker um, TV series. And they, then they did this script, which is obviously, I'm assuming, Roland Emmerich was attached and then brought his, in his own writer to rewrite it um, and just kept their premise, really. So this was 1992. Yes. Um, after that, they did more. <laughs> they didn't. They did, well, they did. Did you know about the whole spitting into two? And I don't understand no. how that happened. I don't know if it was because the script was written and then rewritten, but it's split into two. There are two different uh, parallel Universal Soldier film series. Um, the first one that came quickest, I think, there were two more films. I think, it's, is it Matt Bregalia? Was he the other cat? No, he wasn't Captain America, was he? In the, um, I mentioned Captain America a lot in this. Mm-hmm. There were two straight to video, which it would have been, I guess, in those days. Matt Battaglia was in Brothers in Arms, which was the sequel in 98. Uh, But he's playing Luke Devereaux. Oh. I don't think anyone else was anyway. Oh, yeah. And Andrew Jackson was playing Andrew Scott. And Gary Busey was in it. And Burt Reynolds was in it as Mentor. (laughs) That's a great name. And again, the parents are back with different people. So it was... It was like a reboot, it sounds like. It's an average rating of 2.8 on IMDb. So they did Universe Soldier 2, Brothers in Arms, and then a third one, I think. There were TV movies, actually. I don't know whether they were thinking of making it into a TV series, so everyone was recast. But then 
they also then at that so you think okay so the universe will just continue without Van Damme not very interested but then they did make a sequel in 99 so a year after yeah. that uh, The Return which is not very good directed by Mick Rogers no relation and um, that and it's got um, what's his name Bill Goldberg the wrestler in it and Michael J. White of course the ubiquitous Michael J. White yeah I'm, I'm looking for Morris Chestnut but I can't see him <laughs> uh, <laughs> Call back for those paying attention to other episodes. Nice. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I don't think I've actually seen this this one from 1999. I have, I, because you may have guessed I quite like the first one. Really? But, yeah. Okay. And I watched this one and went, oh, what? what, what? Because he's the only <laughs> surviving member of the team, and now he's helping them create a new, better one. So they've kind of terminated 2 it to a certain extent. Right. Um yeah, the new um, the new Unisol is, is controlled by a computer called Seth, and the government send it after Luke Devereux to kill him because he knows the code and la 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 la. Yeah. And Luke's got a daughter in this I think from memory as well, but I don't even know who with. Right, and then in 2012 they did another one. Well, no, they did another one between them. They've done I think oh my been, God. there have been four with. With Van Damme in. So in this second one, there's no Lundgren. You know, Lund- right. Lundgren. Less. No, you're right. And then... No, you are right. No, 2009, there's Regeneration, which I have seen. Have you seen that one? Nope. Basically, Van Damme and Dolph Lundgren are in it, but in more... Of, How? But not very much. Um, How are they... How's Lundgren in it? He's, he's dog food. Well, he's gone to the wood chipper. I don't actually remember. Yeah, it does play the same character. What happens here? When stolen top secret technology, terrorists have created a next generation universe soldier, and they're all played by UFC people. Uh, uh, and yeah. they're in the, the old Chernobyl nuclear reactor. Basically, it's a cheaper budget and shot in Europe. The only one who can stop them is Luke Devereaux, who's been decommissioned for years. But inside, he discovers not one, but two of these virtually indestructible warriors. Andrew Scott, his vicious enemy from the original film, has been secretly reanimated and upgraded. Um, wait, hang on, hang on. I know technology has moved on a bit, and I know you can piece things back together, but what? <laughs> and so the budgets on these films get smaller and smaller. The second one had 24 million budget, this one has a 10 million budget. But it, by this stage, the fights between the um, UFC people are quite good, as you'd expect. It doesn't feel like a Universal yeah. Soldier film at all. But then, kind of, Van Damme looks a bit tired. Dolph Lundgren looks you know, very tired, and the fight between them is kind of pointless. It's, oh, yeah. nostalgic, oh, isn't it great, 20 years later that they are kind of hitting each other with their zimmers. Um, but it's, uh, I know people who really like this film because they, they like the UFC stuff and the fighting in it is better, but it's still not great. And then the most recent one, which I haven't seen, have you seen the newest one? The 2012? No, Day of Reckoning. Yeah, Day of Reckoning, which, now, this has got uh, Van Damme's long-term friend uh, Scott Adkins in it yes. who's in all his films now but I saw the trailer for this and I think that I thought anyway that yeah. he that um, Van Damme's like a villain in it and I remember I watched that in the trailer and thought I can't watch that uh, I want to say John wakes from a coma to discover his wife and daughter were slaughtered in the brutal home invasion la 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 he is pursued by a relentless unisol named Magnus Magnus, who is played by John, this guy from the third Andrew, film, John against Andrew Scott and an army of genetically enhanced warriors. Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. New, oh, meanwhile, Devereaux and, and Andrew Scott are preparing to battle anarchy and build a new order ruled by Unisols to, uh, without government oversight. So, and the Unisol Church of Eventualism. What? what the, so basically, in oh. this fourth film. Um, uh, one of the characters is Christopher Van Varenberg. Do you know who that is? No. That is Van Damme's son. What? Because Van Varenberg is his real name. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, yeah, so his son is in this. And the, I've just found a picture uh, of him and his son in <laughs> on the set of the quest riding an elephant. <laughs> Ooh, so, okay. Yeah, like you do, because he was in the quest as well. Yes, yeah, so it's... Uh, yeah. Uh, but that sounds like a really stupid idea. From Again, I haven't seen this film, but I hear that Scott Adkins is very good in it. Uh, he's got a bald Van Damme. Yeah, and, he's painful, and I think he paints his face and stuff. But 
why four films in is he a villain now? Or, you know, even I don't get it. I don't know if I can bring I myself to watch. Dolph Lundgren in a red beret. I, I don't get it. Uh, so I don't know. Does, part of me thinks I should watch these to be a completist. Part of me thinks I should move on with my life. <laughs> I think I think the latter. The budget the was eleven and a half million, and its opening weekend it made three thousand one hundred eighty-one dollars in the US. Oh dear! I, I think it went. Um, oh. It probably went on a minimal number of cinemas and went to um, video, the old Valvod, I guess. Wow! Wow, that sounds. Ah, uh, this film is about passing the torch. Okay. Passing the torch because Scott Adkins will be in all future Universal Soldier films. Ooh, it sounds like, as you said, the budget got smaller and smaller in every one, and the story got thinner and thinner. I think uh, when Van Damme and Lundgren walk away, you know it's probably time to knock it on the head. Uh, yes, I think they should have perhaps done that a few films ago, by the sounds of it. From, but no, 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 no. Uh, so. Okay, do we want to do we want to give the score and, and focus more on yeah. the joy of the yes, original? Yes, exactly. Let's, uh, it's one of those films. Didn't need a sequel. It's fine, okay. it's fine as it is. Enough with the yak of the yak. What is your score? Let's give it a score. You go first. Now, I'm not. I um, I found this quite difficult because there was a score in my head from when I first, when I saw it before, and when yep. I watched it repeatedly, when I owned it on X Rental VHS, when I had the posters on my wall. Um, sadly, having watched it again, my appreciation has probably slightly reduced. Maybe, maybe <laughs> due to watching it too many times, uh, okay. or maybe due to some of the things like you mentioned, which are a bit incredulous. I still think this is a much, much better film than people give it credit for. Because when I mention to people I like this film, they laugh at me. Certainly, compared to the action films that are being made now, this is a long way ahead. Had a decent budget. I think people are just a bit prejudiced towards the two lead actors. So I am going to give it four stars. Four bags. Four, four, ba- four stars. I don't know where that even came from. Uh, on, on four bags. Four of bags. Action, sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. four out of five. Wow. Okay. So uh, there would have been. I was expecting it to be five. I went into this with yeah. a deep sense of nostalgia, expecting to give it five uh, bags. Sorry, I, I, mm. I may officially have my my own bags removed after this, <laughs> after this episode. <laughs> well, um, so I, it's been a long time since I've seen it. I'd forgotten bits, uh, as I mentioned along the way. I do like Jean-Claude Van Damme. I do like his films. I think he is much better than, than Dolph. I do like Dolph, but, you know. I think this is, for both of them, is one of their best acting films. I don't know. I, I, th- I think Jean-Claude got, actually got better. Nowhere to Run is, is better again, probably. Some of his films, when he's got more to do and he's got more to say, not necessarily with the cheesy one-liners, but he does do a better job. This was quite wooden on purpose because he's supposed to be a reanimated memory damaged soldier and it, and it works to a certain degree it's like when we talk about Jim Caviezel and person of interest his character is he's, he's you know so wooden if he stands still long enough he'll sprout roots but it works because the character is quite damaged and cut off so yeah. in the same way I think it works in his favour um, whereas Dolph Lundgren seems to be just having a laugh you know having a right old go on do the line do the catchphrase come oh, on sorry it's empty <laughs> that's, I mean, that's he, good acting, you know. Because he's just having a ball with that, that playing catch yeah. and all the rest of it. And can you hear me? And are we having all fun? Yeah, I think yeah, it works. And I think it's it's one of the films where he seems to be enjoying himself the most. Yeah, so I, it's good, but um, I'm going to give it three oh, bags oh, out of five. Okay. I think it's a three bag film. Fair play. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't as bad as I was expecting. I was expecting so you to have. Had you only seen it once before? Uh, maybe twice okay. before, I think. Uh, I was expecting your rose-tinted glasses <sighs> to, to to come off a little bit, and they have a bit. Yeah, I, I wrestled with it. Uh... I nearly gave it five. <sighs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So after that joy fest about talking about all things Universal Soldier, we're empty. Next... <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Peter can have a lie down. Yeah, I'm going to go listen to some Chris Frank music. Hi. We'll be back next episode. You have been listening to Bags of Action. No bullshit.
You'd better stick around for the next episode, because if you're lying, I'll be back.